We are now going to get started with the second session under the theme of East Asian Crisis and its Solutions. And the moderator and the presenters of the session are kindly asked to come up to the stage and take a seat on the stage. So this session is themed uh, with the Asian East Asian crisis and its solutions. 네, 정정드리겠습니다. 지금 제2 세션 사회는 박태균 서울대 국 the moderator of um, this session is Professor Park Taegyun, Professor of Good School of International Studies of Seoul National University, Professor Lee Samsung of Hallem ha University, and Professor Choi Dung Jae uh, of um, the uh, National Chungcheong University. And the discussant will be Professor um, Jang Young Hee, Research Professor at Song Kyungwan University, and uh, Ms. Jung Da Hoon, a researcher at the um, Sogang University and Professor Nishino Jr. from Geyo University. I would like to pass the microphone to Professor Park. Good afternoon. It is nice to meet you and I'd like to thank everyone for participating despite your busy schedule. And I'd like to also thank um, the presenters and the um, discussants. Currently, I am a professor of um, Graduate School of International Studies at Seoul National University. About two years ago, I was a presenter. I was supposed to be, a, a be here, but because I had a knee surgery, I, I had to join you online and now I'm well so I can be here with my own legs and I'm so prov proud of it and we have um, presenters that I've always respected and it is my honor to have all the distinguished um, professors as our presenters and discussants so without further ado I'd like to proceed with the session and the presenters of um, the session are Professor Lee and Professor Chai Dongje. And each presenter has 20 minutes for presentation. First, we have Professor Lee Samsung, of, um, Professor Emeritus of Harlem University. And he was a professor at Catholic University. And he was a visiting professor at Ritz-Meikan University of Japan. And um, he wrote books on American foreign policy, pro perspectives, and the Vietnam. And uh, other books are being used in my lectures and have been cited a lot. So I have always respected him, and I'm looking forward to his presentation. Mm. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. My name is once again E Samsung. I am really honored to be part of the second I mean, session of this f symposium. And every time I come to Busan, I mean, there's a famous song in Korea that says, I mean, come back to Busan port. Ne yes, I am back here again, and I'm really delighted. So now that we are starting the second session under the theme of East Asian crisis and its solutions. So we're and what kind of a resolutions I mean, do we have to overcome this crisis? This is the main topic I'd like to discuss with you today. Well, here, I mean, I'd like to introduce the great division in my presentation today. I mean, this is the term I use quite often. And after the, I mean, post-board word, I mean, 
things have really changed in the East Asia or not? That's a big question I am imposed to for my studies and discussions. How can we explain, I mean, the developments in East Asia in comparison with the developments in Europe and other parts of the world? And to that end, I did a lot of studies and researches. So in this context, uh, this concept, I mean, the great, I mean, division, I believe uh, maybe you already heard, I mean, uh, I explained, I mean, because due to time constraint, I couldn't actually contain all the stories and explanations I'd like to share with you in this presentation. But uh, I fully understand that we have a really, I mean, tight schedule. So I'd like to ask for your understanding. Maybe this is just a really simple or, I mean, yeah, general explanation to help you better understand in a broad sense. So one of the characteristics that, I mean, differentiate, I mean, in East Asia compared to other parts of the world, I mean, after the Cold War or the World Wars, I mean, but in East Asia, the main pillar of the, I mean, regional relations were the relation between the U.S. and China. So yes, there was a I mean Cold War triggered by the tension between the U.S. and Soviet Union, but what directly affected our daily lives? Uh, those are powers, two powers, namely the U.S. and China. So based on their relationships, the countries in the region also had a great influence as well. There are also differences, I mean, how the Cold War played roles in Europe and East Asia. In Europe, I mean, a Cold War, the Cold War was a device that healed the wounds of the war and also, I mean, promoted integration of adversaries. On the other end, in East Asia, the wounds of the war, those were actually frozen and amplified. The main pillar of the, I mean, Great Division in East Asia. So once again, then that's based on the, I mean, the conflicts between the U.S. and China. That is a partially, I mean, the reflection of the tension between U.S. and Soviet Union. But what's important here is that the main pillar of the, I mean, the Great Division post-war Cold War, and there are subdivisions in Vietnam and in Taiwan and other parts of the region. But these were all, I mean, interconnected, intertwined at some point, amplifying at some point, I mean, alleviating the, the tensions. So there are key features that cannot be seen, that couldn't be seen in Europe. So we have a quite unique system in this region. That's one point I'd like to underline here. So what actually triggered or and gave a birth to the Great Division in East Asia? That's the, I mean, this great rivalry between China versus the alliance of the U.S. and China and Japan. So yes, the post-Cold War means that there's no more Cold War in Europe. But in East Asia, it wasn't the end of Cold War. So we still had some, I mean, remnants of Cold War after or in the period of so-called, I mean, post-Cold War era. So the tensions are constantly recharged and uh, resurfaced. So in the face of I mean, post-Cold War, how did it evolve? That's what I'd like to I mean, look into further in detail. There are several phases. In the first phase is the period between 1990 and 2010. Back then, China was for the first time integrated into the global capitalism capitalistic economy. So the economic, I mean, interests were shared. And in this period, that's, I mean, in the beginning of the 21st century, drove the, I mean, advanced or upgraded the 21st century I mean, arms race, including missile defense. And in response, Russia and China in particular, China actually achieved a great economic growth. And based on that, they build up the, their capabilities and competence to compete with, China, with the US as a global hegemony. And the second phase is the period between I mean, Ali and mid-2010s. During this period, 
The alliance between the U.S. and Japan was recognized by China as the realistic threat for them to actually retake the maritime hegemony in the region. And actually, the alliance between the U.S. and Japan, they publicly declared that they would try to achieve the rebalance in Asia and also militarily have China in check. And there is a new cold era, the cold war between the, I mean, the Western world and Russia. And there are several key features we need to put in keep in mind that I mean there are countries or regions in between, and there are I mean conflicts of a national nationalism of Russia. And the second of all, under the regime uh, the power of Putin. Once again, the I mean the geopolitically, I mean the middle ground countries, they are now in confusion and affected by this I mean power struggle between the Western world and and the new Cold War in Europe. And that to some extent promoted or strengthened the pro Western I mean movement or will willingness of these countries. And the third element is that uh, the great division in East Asia, as I mentioned earlier, from a military perspective, the Western world's, I mean, the containment or efforts to contain China is in play. If we compare the periods, uh, two periods during the Cold War and after the Cold War, if you look at the Western world, in the previous period, the Great Division developed or evolved on the back of the global Cold War system. But in the 21st century, this new Cold War we are witnessing between the Western world and against Russia, now the Great Division in this region is dependent on that structure. Now, the Great Division is coming into the third phase. And this is the, I mean, the period between 2010 and 20. 10 and up until now. This is a period that we need to, I mean, to look into the evolved relationship between the US and China and also involving Russia, as I mentioned earlier. Up until the second phase, I mean, the, the US has tried to have I mean, China in check or contain China from an economic and uh, military perspective. But now it's taking a different perspective from geoeconomic. I mean, containment is in play. This is a difference between what has happened in the past. So for the last 30 years, the I mean, the social economic changes within the US also played a role as well. And within the US, there are there were a lot of I mean, changes due to polarization that obviously triggered, I mean, by polarization in terms of the social and economic perspectives amongst Americans. And that also gave a great division in the nation as well. And obviously, we cannot I mean, miss out on the developments triggered by the I mean, Trump administration. As you already well know, the U.S.-driven democracy is now facing threat. And the Democratic parties and President Biden's response was almost like an anti-globalization and also anti-immigration populism. And what's quite surprising is that all those, I mean, actions actually worked for the ruling power to gain support from the public. This is a threatening the very democracy of the nation as well. As part of that, a good example is that the G4, so-called the G4 alliance. So this is a new mercantilism. So
And if there's any plan to, to solidify or make uh, the great division in the region permanent, this is part of the, I mean, players. And some say the, I mean, Chinese economies now can be called as, I mean, market Leninism combined by, I mean, national capitalism. So now they are now, we are now approaching a stage of a kind of a vicious circle. And this new Cold War is now kind of a symbiosis. So February this year, Russia invaded Ukraine, and, and that's based on three conditions. First one, I mean, they're regressing a role of the United States in the global arena. So, yes, so to some extent, we feel that U.S. at least, I mean, Biden administration is trying hard to play a bigger role in East Asia. But if you look at the, I mean, Afghanistan, the war in Afghanistan, Syria, and the weakened alliance and protectionism of the United States uh, still continued by the Biden administration, all these uh, I mean, signal that the big roles played by U.S. is retreating. And also, I mean, in the China, the authoritarianism is strengthening. So the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the key or maybe the most important element is that now the great division system in East Asia is now intensifying and the legitimacy of the system is once again increasing. So with the help of I mean, China, so GDP in, of Russia in 2022, I mean, it's less than one tenth, I mean, a little bit lower than that of Korea. But with the support, so without having support from China, Russia wasn't in the past able to actually stand sanctions posed by the Western world. So actually, Russia is dependent on this great division system established in East Asia. And in the past, I mean, by announcing joint statement, there were, I mean, exchanges of the alliance that the NATO should not be expanded and etc. So in all these developments, I mean, can be seen both as an opportunity and a crisis to the United States. So once again, the I mean, Russia's invasion of Ukraine in this year, and also its annexation of I mean, the Crimea. I mean, Russia is obviously he can maintaining close economic relations with Russia, with China. So there are another three elements that again lead to the I mean, decreasing role of the U.S. So there are once again the three. There are I mean three key objectives of the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So first of all, to, to actually block the energy support or provision between Europe and Russia, and also to raise the level of I mean economic containment of China, and then also to, to satisfy the political motive to write in out the U.S.'s anti-globalism. We know the peace crisis in East Asia is in the third f phase of Grand Division, and the Korean Peninsula is under crisis with the incumbent um, government, and uh, they um, said they will do the preemptive strike or decapitation strike. And if you if you watch the show from the um, ground wave um, TV stations, uh, we even demonstrated how the decapitation strike will be done. So the joint drill between the US and China uh, was done on the land, sea, and air. And um, to, to cope with this, um, North Korea uh, launched um, IRBM and um, SLBM. It also legalized the five conditions of preemptive nuclear strike. And the tension in the Taiwan Strait is escalating as well. And if you go 
one step further. This year, if you look at East Asia in um, 2022, there are some similarities um, in the situation of Europe right before the First World War. And that is um, the, the continent is rigidly polarized in terms of military system. And right before World War I, the UK and um, France um, worked hard to isolate um, Germany, just like US-Japan um, alliance is trying to isolate the rising China. And the surrounding countries of the power centers in the local order are there, like the Balkan states um, in, the, in the case of Europe and uh, Korea and Taiwan in the case of East Asia. And the globalization and, deep, and deepening of economic interdependence is growing. However, they gradually try to abandon free trade and rising protection, and the protectionism is rising. And they are preoccupied with the bipolar military alliance system and arms race, while the notion that economic interdependence preserves peace uh, remains. They are still optimistic that the um, peace will still be maintained even right before the um, arms race and military conflict. So there is no sign of any disruption in the peace, even in the stock market. Then what are the options that East Asian countries can take? We can think of three options. First choice is to take advantage of the existing polarized military alliance system, focus on the arms race and individual economic neo-mercantilism. And the uh, vicious cycle of tension in the large division system will continue. And the tension in the Taiwan, uh, uh, Taiwan Strait and the Korean Peninsula will continue. And the increasing risk, the assumption is that the alliance with the United States can provide long-term military security and the benefits of economic security supply chains. But and the second option is to maintain the current alliance with the U.S. Uh, while seeking to expand their qualitative um, armament, including their own nuclear armament. So what's left with us is third option. I think that's the option that we have to take. That is um, in East Asia, including Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines and Vietnam, we think of the uh, alternative East Asia uh, to a dream of a vision with um, its visibility. East Asian allies of the United um, States, including Japan and Korea, should maintain a constant military alliance with the U.S. And uh, it sh they should reconcile it with the efforts to pursue common security mechanisms consistent with the overriding universal value of peace in East Asia. And the efforts to form an alternative culture that dreams of common security in East Asia, in which East Asian governments, civil society, academia, and the intellectual community of East Asia value and share the value and the vision of balanced diplomacy. We shouldn't uh, be buried um, in the uh, notion that polarized military alliance system is unchangeable. We have to maintain a certain distance from that system, objectively evaluate and criticize it. East Asian countries, including Japan and Korea, do, should not stay at the outposts or rear wheels of the alliance. Rather, they should be the steering wheels of the alliance system and um, to actively uh, change the geopolitical vision. Diplomats, academics, journalists, and soldiers are the natural uh, roles of our security and diplomacy, and that should be the view that we should hold. It's a difficult task, but that's the only option that is left with us to begin the to over 
begin overcoming the grand division in East Asia. So what is the first assignment that we have to tackle towards option three? Uh, excuse me, please wrap up your presentation. Uh, well, uh, uh, let me conclude my presentation. So um, in the peace regime on the Korean Peninsula, please uh, refer to the book. But I think you have to have some concluding remarks for your presentation. I, I wanted to say in my conclusion, The peace regime or peace treaty is difficult to negotiate, and the U.S. opposes it anyway. So we have to denuclearize North Korea in a different way. Then, the measures for um, security measures against North Korea, or the um, device through which North Korea can safely engage in denuclearization, and if we think uh, we can change North Korea without any uh, measures of this, I think that's a great illusion. And that illusion will um, pressure North Korea for implosion. Then I think that will just um, usher in the um, nuclear disaster on the Korean Peninsula. That's what I believe. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your presentation. I'm sorry that I had to stop you in the middle. I think you ran two minutes, 35 seconds later. I mean, more than your presentation, given the presentation time. I think you gave us a, you brought a very important points and my major is history. And I really like the part that you compared e Europe before World War I and your current um, East Asia. It was a pity that we couldn't um, fully uh, look your um, concluding part. So I'd like to ask you to supplement it in your um, Q&A session. Next presenter is Professor Sai Tung Jae, connected via Zoom. From Taiwan, I think he's been waiting for quite some time. Okay, let me briefly introduce him. I mean, Dr. Tsai is now the director of Advanced Research Center for Humanities and uh, Social Science, distinguished professor of Institute of International Politics. So, uh, Dr. Tsai has uh, gotten his PhD degree from Taiwan's National Ching Ching University in 1999 and uh, been the visiting scholar in Japan. So, Okayama University and South Korea's Korea University and Hanguk University. He has been written over, I mean, 15 books. So he's been an active participant in various, I mean, international conferences, both um, home and abroad. So I'd like to invite Dr. Tsai for 20 minutes for his presentation. Okay, Professor Chai Dungje. Would you please start your presentation? Okay, could, could you hear me? Okay, yeah, we can see and please the, the make your presentation in 20 minutes, please. Okay, yeah, so everyone can see my slide, maybe? Yes, we can see. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Chai from Tai Taiwan and uh, the Johnson University, and I'm very glad to invite you to join this conference. And actually, I, I've been to Seoul every year before the pandemic, but uh, I never I never been to the, the Busan. Yeah, so I'm sorry. I, but I know that Busan is a very beautiful city, and I hope maybe the next time I can visit and so this city. Okay, so uh, I will try my hard to finish my presentation in 20 minutes. Okay, so uh, actually I, I very agree to the Professor Lee, their presentations about the great grant uh, division in the East, uh, East Asia international relations. Okay. And also I, maybe I share, I mean, I, I share my conclusion first, or maybe. Okay. So I think that since the core arrows, okay, the 
East Asia International Structures, the US is the creators. And uh, uh, they uh, maybe still, uh, till now, uh, through the post Cold War, Cold War period, the, the US is still uh, the, uh, the leaders of the, these structures. But, some, but we know the, the international uh, the, the regional structures in East, uh, East Asia. Uh, since the Cold War may be stable, but still a little bit uh, dynamic. Sometimes it will change, but not so much, not so much. But every time, every time the structures uh, the changes, and they will invite uh, some uh, some different event uh, to more or, or something both we can uh, observe uh, the change of the structures. And I, I and in my presentations, I will take the Taiwan uh, Taiwan Strait uh, the crisis to be a example or the symbol to observe the the. Uh, the, the the transformation of the structures. Okay, so and we know that uh, the uh, Taiwan and the maybe the Taiwan and the China the closer relations is uh, the same with the two Korea relations. Uh, both the legacy of the Cold Wars. Okay, so because the structures is uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, created a st regional structure in East Asia, and so the a uh, lot of the lot of the uh, development in in the, the regional affairs uh, follows the U.S. structures. Okay, uh, strategy. So uh, when uh, U.S. can decide decide uh, some things, maybe he want to do to and want want to get uh, the the interest in in the regional affairs. So so sometimes the he will invite the, the, the change in in the regionals. Okay. So uh, in so I here I will trace back to the histories to introduce introduce the four times. Uh, crisis in the, the Taiwan Strait, okay, between the China and the and the Taiwans. Maybe everyone knows the uh, the Thai, the China and the Taiwan uh, divided uh, because of the unfinished uh, civil wars uh, since the nineteen forty nine, and and after that, okay, in my in my uh, definitions, uh, so the they have been to uh, four times of the crisis, okay. But but my, my definition a little bit different with the common, the traditional definitions, okay. So according to the, the traditional uh, the definitions, the, they have uh, three times before, including uh, the 1949, and then, sorry, 1954, uh, 1954 and 1958, and the 1950, uh, 1995, three times. But but in my definitions, okay. So we have still uh, the other one the crisis in the nineteen seventies, and also including the right now. Okay, maybe around the two thousand twenty two. Okay, and so we uh, have have four time four times of the crisis in in uh, in the history and the, and including the right now the situations. Okay, so I will uh, maybe introduce very briefly case by case. Okay. So uh, I I try to combine combine the the first uh, the traditional first crisis and the second crisis. Uh, the first crisis is uh, in the nineteen forty nine. Okay, but but because the the, the times is very close to the nineteen forty eight. So and the, and the background is very similar. So I combined it become one uh, crisis. Okay. So in in that times it, it in, it's in the uh, the beginning of the Cold War. Okay. So. Uh, but but still, the, in that times, the China China is under a, a unfinished civil war. Uh, but we know, uh, according to U.S. Uh, strategy, uh, maybe the, including the global or the regional uh, strategy, uh, actually the U.S. U.S. try to uh, have a cold war with the the Soviet. But uh, in East Asia, I, I think in that times, U.S. not just decided how to deal with the China affairs, and maybe one. Uh, of the choice, uh, the options or the choice is 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 to ally with the China. I mean the Beijing. Okay, so in 1949, so the, then U.S. released uh, uh, white papers about the China affairs. Uh, actually, actually, we know that it was pre prepared, yeah, to have an official relation with the Beijing. But but uh, but in that times, uh, the surprise. Uh, is the Korea Wars okay? So in ninety four in nineteen fifties okay, the Korea Wars is as price to U.S. strategy okay because especially because the Beijing joined uh, the, the, the this wars okay. So because the the Beijing joined this war and they become the enemy, 
in the battlefield with the U.S. So uh, it means the U.S. Uh, could not, it, it's impossible for U.S. to uh, have an official relationship with the Beijing uh, immediately. Okay, so for, for U.S. is the puzzles, okay, or the uh, dilemmas how to deal with the, the re relation with Beijing, yeah, before and, and after the, the Korean War. So uh, so in, in that time, in, in the 1945, uh, the, the U.S. tried to, uh, Try to rebuild uh, the relation with the Taipei first, and uh, to maybe just to look, look and look and wait the the, the next situations. But for the Beijing's, okay, so Beijing also knows because the U.S. still have a talk with the Beijing's, okay. So uh, U.S. decide to have a to rebuild the relation with the Taipei, but and for Beijing's, yeah, he still try to test. Maybe the real lie or the what the, the US really want to do. So the 90, 1940, 1945, okay, so we, we can see the, the happens of the of the first Kimon crisis. Okay, so uh, the 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 Beijing they launch uh, yeah they launch a, a mini wars in in the in the Kimon Islands and Islands. Okay, so we, we call that uh, the first Kimon crisis or the first the Taiwan Taiwan Strait crisis. It's it's a very short times. Okay, so after that uh, after that, so we can see that it's the first. Uh, first the Taiwan Strait crisis. Okay, so I find it uh, it not the not continuous so, so long times. So just maybe just a couple months, and after that, after that, in in 1955. Okay, so uh, the 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 US uh, try have a two hand yeah uh, policies. Okay, so in one hand, yes, uh, the the US US still maintains the official relation with Taipei, and the other hands. Okay, so they reopen. Uh, talks in Warsaw in the uh, European uh, Europe uh, with the Beijing. Okay, so uh, they it, it, actually we, we can we can find that so, so the US uh, still uh, want, uh, regard the Beijing as maybe a potential partners. Okay, in the early Cold War era. Okay, but uh, when when US focus in, in the East Asia situation, so and other things happens in the Europe or maybe the Middle East. And then the how the, the administration decided to uh, maybe yeah, yeah uh, uh, continue to look. Okay, so in the 1948, US came uh, uh, the Eisenhower uh, the administration uh, they, they declare uh, the non -recon recognition policy to the main China's. Okay, it means it means the US uh, try to keep the, their support yeah, to to Taipei. Uh, so it, it's uh, another time. So uh, the, the the Beijing's want to know, yeah, what do you want to do really? Okay, so they uh, also launched a mini war in the in the Kimon. So so uh, we 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 call that so called the second Kimon crisis or the second Taiwan Strait crisis. Okay, but after that, after that, okay. So U.S. in the ninety four in nineteen fifteen fifty eight they. Also reopen and continue the Warsaw was the Warsaw talk with the with the China's and so it's the it's, it's the first time we, we talked about the first and uh, the crisis in Taiwan Strait. Okay, so uh, uh, it's after the, the crisis uh, the U.S. maybe they uh, everyone knows that U.S. Uh, try to use the uh, island chain strategy. To maintain the stable stability in in the East Asia affairs, so so we can see we can see in since that times they have two island chains, but actually uh, the U.S. just focus on the first island chains. So in in the in 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 this uh, this maps we can see uh, the first island chains, including from the peninsula and including the the Japan's and the Taiwan's and to the Philippines. Okay, so Taiwan is maybe Taiwan is the is in the located in on the front light of the of the strategy. Okay, so uh, this is the background of the, the first times. Okay, but if the, however, I, I just I say that US still still try to find the the the, the possibility to uh, to deal with the uh, the relation with the, the, the Beijing. So, okay, so uh, actually we know that the the, the Cold War uh, they created a, a, a spatial phenomena that we call that divided nations. Yeah, actually, uh, the the Korea and the Taiwan, uh, the, the Taiwan is also the case of the divided nations. Okay, so the divided nations it means that the uh, the is the com competitions between the two regimes. Uh, uh, maybe not not a uh, military military, but also the the diplomacies. Okay, so 
here I offers a, a, a offers a, a numbers. Okay, so in nine in in nineteen fifty nine, uh, the 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 numbers of the country the countries to maintain the official relation with the Taipei and and versus the Beijing is a uh, uh, forty. Uh, uh, 45 uh, to the 32, and uh, and even in the 1969, okay, it's uh, uh, for, uh, 50, 55 to the uh, to the uh, 65. So Beijing is a little bit uh, uh, take an advantage, okay. Uh, so in so in in the in the 1971, because in that time, Taipei is uh, being kicked out from the national the, the the UN so uh, so the the they, they we, we can see that it's a turning point for in the diplomatic wars between the Tai Taipei and the Beijing and especially yeah in the late uh, the late uh, 1978 uh, after the 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 U the US break uh, to start their official relation with the Taipei so we find a, a totally failure okay so for for Taipei in the 1979s, the Taiwan only uh, kept the 22, 22 countries with, with the official relations to Taipei. Okay, and and the the, the, the countries uh, with the, the uh, have relations with the Beijing is over 100. Okay, now the but the, the more important is the the backgrounds. Okay, so in that time, so we, we know that the the Cold War is a little bit changed. Okay, so uh, U.S. and the Soviet uh, they they begin to have a, a arms control talk since the 19, uh, 1969. Okay, so they have a start one and a start two. We know we know that. Okay, so uh, because the U.S. Uh, try to uh, change. Okay, or or to to uh, adjust their, their strategy in uh, with the uh, Soviet, and then they, they maybe uh, just just as we know, it's called the 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 next industries. Okay, they want to use the negotiations replace. Okay, the to to fight the, the direct the directly. Okay, so uh, because the the U.S. try to change its strategy. Okay, so this means that they 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 more they more want. Okay, the the China can stand stand with the the U.S. They call that so so called the Beijing card. Okay, so when when U.S. Uh, try to use the Beijing card in in their uh, interaction with the Soviets. So uh, that's why that's why the the they uh, the the Taipei or the Taiwan may 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 become a, a sacrifice. So we we know the the nineteen seventy one the. We, uh, the U.S. General, uh, General Assembly they they, they pass uh, the resolutions and they they want to choose the Thai, the China uh, replace the Thai, the Taiwan and next year next year the uh, President President Nixon they they visit Beijing and uh, and, uh, and meet with the Mao Zedong so so uh, suddenly does maybe some something change okay so and after that after that. Uh, the 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 U.S. Uh, they keep the, their talks with the Soviets, and then uh, uh, we they uh, the the U.S. try to have a, a, a normalization with the the the, the relation with the uh, China. Okay, so uh, finally, okay, so actually in in this period in nineteen seventies, okay, so because the uh, the the Cold War, uh, maybe they they go they entering into the next. Next stage. Okay, so the the environment that have something changed. Okay, so uh, the, the, in this time, so so the the US maybe they regard the the you the the Beijing as their the strategic partners. Okay, uh, because they want to uh, together to con uh, to contain with contain the the Soviet. So uh, so uh, the the Taiwan become the sacrifice, and uh, so we 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 face a very very serious crisis in in our the. Foreign, foreign relations. Okay, so uh, 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 in the in, okay, sorry. Um, okay. I'm very sorry. Let you know that you have five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in in the, in, in, we can see that the, the it show the the. the and then we uh, then then is uh, the the third crisis about uh, in the 1995 to the 1996. Okay, so in that times, okay, so we we, we can find uh, U.S. Uh, have something uh, uh, they change their, their view to the China. So we maybe we know uh, in around the 1995. Okay, that is the first time emerging the so called the, the theory of the China threat. Okay, so it means that in that times. When the, the U.S. tried to regard the, 
the, the China as a potential competitor. So that is the background of the, the of the third crisis. Okay, so it's a, uh, we, we want to 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 show that. Okay, so in in the same times, uh, the Taiwan the Taiwan we have uh, uh, to win to win. Uh, to have a, a new democracy, democracy. So, uh, so it's a, it's a, uh, something different in the domestically affairs in in Taiwan. Okay. So then after that, they, we we uh, we have uh, uh, the fourth crisis in in this years. That yeah. So we we know that maybe it's uh, because because we know that the the uh, the policy the 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 mass policy to to meet the, to the meet Taiwan. So. Uh, it's the direct backgrounds, but actually, actually, okay, the, the crisis have a more long, more 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 macro background because the the China and the U.S. relations. Just as the professor Lee said that, okay, so uh, they they are in the in the uh, direct competitions uh, in the this year. So so we, we find U.S. people to ask us, and uh, in the same times. Uh, China try to go 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 outside and more and more more the the obviously so it's a it's a new situation so in so it's what we 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 can see that in the in the recent the, the regional affairs okay so uh, because of, because of the 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 time the limitations so I maybe I, I just go to the, con the conclusions okay so uh, if we compare compare the the four times okay. Of the the the, uh, con uh, the crisis uh, in the Taiwan Strait, okay. So we we, we use uh, so find the variable to uh, to compare the the, the full time of the crisis. We can we can see some, uh, something different, okay. So the first time is the the uh, systemic stability, okay. Okay. So and then the 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 second variable is is referred to the gaps, the power gap between the U.S. and the China, and then the and the third uh, variable is, is a it's uh, to 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 see that if the U.S. and China uh, share, if they they share the overlapping interest, okay. So the more the more interest they they overlapping, so maybe the not so not so tricky, okay. And then the 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 four. The fourth uh, variable is, is, is about about uh, if the U.S. or or the China they want to maintain the status quo or not or not. If they want they if they both they of them want to maintain the status quo, of course the crisis will will yeah, not so not so serious. Okay. Finally, finally, yeah. If you if the U.S. support Taiwan, okay. So the the the, the crisis is uh, is under control. Oh, but. Uh, if the U.S. is not really want to support Taiwan, okay, uh, so the the situation will will different, okay. So in 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 these figures, uh, if we see that if more the plus the the plus, okay, no, no more the plus, and uh, it means if, even we 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 look at the the crisis, the crisis is really happens, but it's not a really big big problem, okay. But uh, really, relatively, okay. So if we see the more the minus, okay, it means okay. So the the the, the crisis is uh, more unstable, and maybe uh, maybe they will some uh, some something will happen in in the future. So just just a lot of people to to see that okay. So uh, in the recent uh, recently, okay, we see uh, actually not not just uh, in the in these years, okay, in. In past few years and in the uh, in the see about the 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 recent uh, the, 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 the 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 some years after the after that okay so uh, so we we can see the possibility yeah to happen some kind of the war uh, the yeah is 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 really rise okay so uh, so in in the future okay I think I think it's not just the the uh, the situation in in Taiwan Strait. Or in the crisis uh, in the cross trade relations, and also also we can we can see in the same times okay the situation in the, in in Korean Peninsula is also not so unstable okay so it's because that we uh, the the, Thai, the Taiwan case and the, the Korea case we share the same background and the same structures uh, so maybe maybe the the the, the situation inter, in uh, interaction or, or inter the connections uh, we can more we can. Folks more concern more more the concern about that. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry to 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 uh, to say too much because uh, but I I would just try to stop here and maybe we can have time to discuss with everyone. Thank you very much. Thank okay. You. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Cha. 
Uh, and also, the, I'd like to appreciate the, the you finished the, the, your presentation on time. Just 30 seconds over, but it's okay. And uh, it is great, impressive to me, the, the, you mentioned about the, the uh, history of the, the uh, Taiwan the Strait the crisis from the, the early 1950s. So the, the, it was, I think, that the, the really the, the, uh, the experience to the, give us some lessons about the, the, uh, these days the, the Taiwan Strait the, the crisis, but still, I think that there are some the, the differences and the, the commonality between the, the historical experience and nowadays the crisis. I think that we can discuss about them more during the, the discussion session, as you mentioned. Thank you very much. Next, uh, we are going to have a um, discussion. Our first um, discussant will be Professor Zhang Yonghee. Uh, research professor at Songgyungwan Institute for China Studies at Songgyungwan University. I think um, his research institute uh, comes up with the latest and most accurate news on China. And Songgyun China Brief I use a lot. And he is now um, chief. Um, editor of the magazine, so I'm really looking forward to his discussion. He had authored some books and papers, and currently he uh, wrote an article on U.S.-China strategic competition and changes in cross-trade relations. Okay, five minutes, I got it. Thank you very much. Well, well, I really appreciate the interesting presentation by, I mean, Lee Samsung and Professor Chai dong -jae. So let me briefly share my, I mean, opinions on those issues. Well, regarding the Taiwan Strait and the Korean Peninsula, the current, I mean, situation, what are the commonalities? I believe that both lost the channel for communication or dialogue. So the, I mean, loss of communication, that is the commonality. And yes, those are mainly because of the I mean authoritarian authoritarian structure in play. For example, I mean the China is not willing to have I mean talks or discuss with the I mean the current uh, Taiwan government. And first of all, the, what I mean, the Professor Samsung Lee said it, that yes, he highlighted the importance of I mean peace treaty or peace agreement. But it's by no means, I mean, easy. That's what he mentioned. So, yes, because it is difficult. I mean, that doesn't mean that we should give up. I mean, it's difficult, but still we need to work on achieving, I mean, peace agreement in the near future. And this is, I mean, once again, common challenge. And yes, I mean, kind of a homework for both regions, for I mean, Korean Peninsula and the Taiwan Strait issues. So, I mean, obviously, there is, I mean, researcher Richard Bush, I mean, one of the, I mean, the renowned researchers around the world, I mean, one for me as well. So when, and he wrote a book last year, I mean, difficult choices, maybe you already know. So he is a kind of an expert, I mean, studying this, I mean, Taiwan issue for over three and four decades. He gave a lot of recommendations and sites. And on, in that book, what he, I mean, recommended is that, well, the U.S. is obviously working for their own interest. That's the cruel reality. We should acknowledge it. So if Taiwan overly depends on I mean, to U.S., it will not certainly help. So Taiwan should look for measures by themselves. So I think uh, this is in line with what, I mean, uh, Professor Lee Samsung said, uh, that we should actually strike a peace agreement between the, I mean, the struggling powers. So what uh, Dr. Tsai said is that, I mean, there have been four crises in the, I mean, Taiwan Strait. And uh, on the basis that uh, there are the struggle between US and China, yes, maybe it's already well known, but still very important to highlight. So, I mean, just last week, I mean, President Xi Jinping 
Now security is third time so, and there was a, I mean, really important statement he made that he will certainly make, I mean, Taiwan reunified with Beijing, even if necessary by force. So President Xi once again showed his very hawkish, I mean, stance in terms of the, I mean, the issues surrounding Taiwan. So against this backdrop, I think it's really important for Taiwan to secure really good and active channel for communication and dialogue because I do not have a lot of time given for my, I mean, discussion. So, I mean, there are key two messages what I had in mind. The first one is that on the Korean Peninsula, I mean, being it, uh, I mean, Taiwan Strait, where, being where it is, I mean, if there is a kind of, I mean, conflict of military forces, Yes, at one point, I mean, there may be some, I mean, national interest we may lose, but that shouldn't be the only focus we have. There may be tremendous, I mean, ripple effects in terms of social, economic, and international perspectives. So we shouldn't be solely focused on sovereignty, I mean, perspectives. So in China, when they see the Taiwan issue, yes, they think this is solely their sovereignty issue. So nobody else should actually tell them what to do. But, I mean, President Xi Jinping, I mean, as he highlighted several times that, that the humanity is one, I mean, big community. We are one. So what happens between China and Taiwan will certainly have implications on other parts of the world. And, I mean, this may lead to also the third world war, even a nuclear war. So nobody wants to that happen. So just keeping that in mind, we should actually look for the future direction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for um, keeping your time of uh, five minutes. So you made uh, some comments as well as some questions to the two presenters. And Professor Lee Samsung said uh, it may sound idealistic, but that's the only option that we have. Although um, it may be difficult, but that's the path that we have to take. And I uh, included that similar thing in my column that's going to be published tomorrow. So, so that was our dilemma. And I'd like to um, invite our second discussant, and she is a research fellow at the Institute of Social Science at Sogang University. She is well known for her books, um, international. She wrote many books on um, China and many interesting books. China studies in big data era, and she earned her um, doctoral degree at Peking University. I am Jung Dahun. It is very nice to meet you all. I really enjoyed the two presentations. I believe um, the summary will be done by our moderator. I would like to ask the question. Um, there were three things that I had, uh, three questions that I had in the Professor Lee's presentation. In the absence to 2000s, maybe we blindly trust in the um, geo e economic uh, theory that is raising the um, that is disturbing the East Asian security. But if we compare World War One and the um, the current status when the economy and the trade has been universalized, I think um, there are fundamental structural differences between these two times or situations. And the level of economic interdependence is much, much stronger um, now than before. So how should we take this point? And the second question is, I really, uh, that was also a wonderful insight. And the Russia's invasion on Ukraine is an opportunity as well as a crisis. That's what you said. And it, I think that had carries a lot of um, in meanings in predicting the future. So do you still think um, this war is still an opportunity for US to have the global hegemony? Or what are the things that will cast Christ that will make this war a crisis to the US? And my third question is, if you read the paper and the footnotes of your paper, 
And the third key to East Asia, uh, um, you emphasize the meaning of the peace on the Korean Peninsula and the So you, I agree to the idea that peace treaty is very important. And in your footnote, you said a denuclearized zone. You talked about denuclearized zone that is separate from the arms race. And you didn't uh, um, specify it further. But if we, if we separate this denuclearized zone and the uh, military actions, then this having a denuclearized zone that may not have any meaning. So I would like to know what you think about this. And for the second presentation by Professor Chai, Well, I have only one question about your presentation. And the U.S. Um, defines China as the largest competitor, but um, the U.S. does not, uh, is not sure if um, the U.S. is defining the China as the biggest threat to um, its a threat to the world like it does with Iran or um, our, uh, other countries. How should we deal with um, the crisis and cross straight um, crisis, uh, area? And my question is, so do you still think um, the U.S. is looking at China as a competitor or um, a party that will threaten Ch the U.S. That is that uh, the reason why you put a minus in that factor? Thank you for keeping your time. Those questions coincide with the questions that I had. Uh, we keep talking about security, and I tell my students the international relations is about money and economic factor is the largest one. But if you just talk about money, you look cheap. That's why you have to relate um, this international relations with security and and policy. In order to talk about this, we have to talk about SOC and other um, alliances that all are related to the financial issues. And we also have to think about um, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. And as the um, China is physically linking other um, countries with this initiative, um, the U.S. feels threatened by the expansion of China, physical expansion of China. Well, uh, in the next section, we will talk about global supply chain. But I think we can lightly touch upon this issue in this session. And my question to Professor Chai is, how should we understand the relationship between the U.S. and China? Thank you. Last but not least, we have a Professor Nishino Jr. I personally really look fond of him. I learned a lot from him. And um, Professor Nishino is, I mean, back in 1960s and 70s, I mean, to his I mean, PhD paper, I think, I mean, the historical relationship between Korea and China is really, I mean, significant and very, I mean, excellent, I mean, to research paper. And uh, he has also served as a, I mean, the head of the center on, I mean, the studies on the Korean Peninsula. And he has visited, I mean, to Korea several times, studied in uh, South Korea as well. So I really appreciate that he joins us. Uh, once again, you have five minutes. I mean, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to just to briefly discuss the three points. Uh, first of all, I mean, regarding Professor Lee's I mean, paper and presentation. I mean, first of all, it was a great honor for me to have a chance to actually read, I mean, his paper. I mean, this is an excellent work. Yes, I mean, the, the interactions in terms of, I mean, the Cold War and the differences between Europe and East Asia. Yeah, from my perspectives, yes, I've been, I mean, studying this area for several years, but most interesting in this regard, or maybe most meaningful, is that the subdivisions 
are now, I mean, that have been actually impacting a lot for the Great Division. So in particular on the Korean Peninsula, I mean, in Vietnam, I mean, Ho Chi Minh was the epicenter. So these, I mean, the subdivisions in East Asia, I mean, they these served as something that actually rattled the great powers, I mean, the, namely the U.S. and China and sometimes in Russia as well. So from that perspective, when I read, I mean, Professor Lee's paper, so I think maybe it's also helpful to keep something in mind. For example, I mean, those small countries are no longer small countries. I mean, maybe you already, I mean, know that Korea is no longer a small country. I mean, not small power country. And Taiwan as well is now recognized as a really mature democracy. I mean, Vietnam is not seen as they are before. I mean, they are also growing very fast. So those stances are now changed compared to, I mean, past. So maybe in the past, they were considered as really small countries in the region. But now they are no longer small countries. So they are now big parties, actors. So maybe keeping that in mind, so you can have I mean, different perspectives. I mean, that's one point. The first point I'd like to share with you. And the second one is that, I mean, if you look at the current political, I mean, developments, maybe this is a common at the same time a question. So yes, uh, you mentioned, I mean, three scenarios. The first one is that, I mean, to, I'm just, I mean, to, destructing or destroying, abandoning the alliance, or the second one is I mean, keeping it, and third one, maybe the most advisable one, keeping the I mean, alliance. And at the same time, the reasons in uh, countries in the region are actually putting efforts together to I mean, actually form a bigger alliance, maybe, I mean, more solid one. So, but if you look at the current situation in China, I mean, if you look at Japan and Korea, Yes, I mean, they, are, they seem like something in between, between the second and third. So they are not officially, I mean, raising their armed forces, but they are kind of, I mean, having concerns. I mean, which one should we choose? I mean, can we just maintain this status quo? Is it really the right way to go? Or should we beef up our I mean, military forces and try to enhance our influences. So there are a lot of, I mean, very complex, realistic, I mean, concerns for these, I mean, countries involved in the region or from a long term perspective. Yes, in the long term perspectives, it's the right way to pursue the third scenario. But maybe short term perspectives, maybe something in between should be the, I mean, road. I'd like to, I mean, hear more from I mean, Professor Lee. And the third point is that, I mean, yes, he talked about the peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. I mean, it's one of the scholars. I have a great interest in that issue as well. And in the previous Moon Jae-in administration, the peace process was, I mean, yeah, I feel very unfortunate that it didn't really succeed. But if you, when I read your paper, uh, yes, I mean, taking the initiative to actually have a peace treaty. Maybe there were some, I mean, mistakes made by the previous Moon Jae-in administration. Yes, to some extent, I agree with you. But this peace treaty should be the starting point for this new peace order. Yes, I agree with you in principle. But on the on the other hand, such efforts, I mean, there have been a lot of, I mean, attempts and, I mean, efforts back in 2005. I mean, there were joint declarations and roadmaps were introduced. There were a lot of, I mean, several attempts, but at the end of the day, it didn't work. I mean, the North Korea walked away or turned their back against these, I mean, efforts to actually bear fruits in terms of, I mean, peace treaties. So it was really difficult to get North Korea, I mean, go till the end of the, I mean, journey. So from what I see, maybe that is the reason why this is still too idealistic, but and if you look at the current or recent act behaviors of North Korea, maybe it's really difficult for us to have that dream, I mean, materialized in the near future. And at this point in particular, maybe the response of South Korea, maybe too lax, too unresponsive. That, I mean, to some extent, that's how I feel. Maybe that is the reason why the current, I mean, Yun administration, yes, it's conservative, I mean, to stance. But he said, well, I have an audacious initiative, but what is it exactly? I mean, how are you going to actually pursue it? I mean, 
there should be kind of a good mixture between progressive approach and conservative approach. Of course, it's really not easy, but it should be the balanced approach. I mean, step by step, gradual approach. That's uh, I personally feel at least I mean on the Korean Peninsula. And we should have a clear roadmap, a correct one. There should be the I mean the right I mean the guidance for us. Okay, I think I used one minute and ten minutes more than given. Sorry about that. Do we have any questions from the floor? If you have questions, we have papers ready for you. Please write them down and hand it over to our staff. We will collect them. Okay, we will take a couple of moments to take. I mean, answers from I mean two presenters. First, Professor. Lee and Professor Jai, one minute each, okay? Thank you for your um, uh, points and discussions. I'd like to answer the questions um, uh, raised by Professor Junior, Nishino Junior. Uh, you asked about the phased approach, and I am not dividing. Um, I'm not. I, I'm against the idea of um, dividing the approaches into phased approaches or um, all at once approach. But we have to uh, develop a methodology that uh, takes a dual track. And when the uh, the six part tight um, joint declaration. Uh, failed, and that, uh, you said it it was failed because um, North Korea walked away. But I have a slightly different different idea. In two thousand and five, um, in the septem in September, the Bush administration's uh, uh, state secretary uh, Rice uh, pushed ahead with um, this uh, joint declaration. And the defense um, secretary and the uh, the Bush, the President Bush, also agreed to that uh, to that idea, and their intention was to melt um, North Korea. So this blanket approach and the phased approach, I mean, they, they thought the blanket approach was the, uh, the 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 answer to change uh, North Korea, and. Uh, and even before the, the uh, right after the joint declaration was signed, Banco Delta Asia uh, crisis erupted. Uh, on, on, uh, citing that as a reason, the U.S. launched a sanction against North Korea. And um, in 2001, uh, Colin Powell uh, said in the U.S. document, there is no clear evidence that the North Korea um, walked away from the Geneva Agreement. And right after that, the U.S. said the Geneva Agreement still holds um, a meaning. And then right after that, it was officially um, discarded. So there were inconsist there was inconsistency in uh, the Bush administration. So I'd like to ask Professor Chai for the, uh, to answer, and then I will get back to you later. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, I I will. Uh, thanks so so much for everyone to share the opinions. Okay. So maybe I could not uh, answer directly, but I just want to share uh, my personal uh, uh, some ideas. Okay. So, uh, I actually I I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic. So uh, for the future situations because I, I we know that though the U.S. government really regard officially. The, the China is the uh, uh, re, uh, uh, revision revisionist. Okay, so but we also know the the the, Ch the U.S. also try to revise the status quo. Okay, so everyone knows that because the American first. Okay, so uh, in the future, okay, so I think the the Taiwan Strait crisis is is a very is a simple to uh, to uh, help us to look at. Okay, so even the, the state the structure. 
uh, if you can maintain very stable or not. Okay, so uh, in the future, in the near future, I, I, I think it's okay. So in, in my tables, in my tables, uh, in the recent crisis, the only press, I give them, uh, the, I give them uh, positive marks is, is I, I think the US and China still have some a little overlapping interest. It's because of economic relations. Okay, they they still have uh, maintained some economics, okay, uh, connections, okay. But because if, if I think if the US uh, uh, continue to decoupling their economic connection with China, okay, they will break the only one, the overlapping interest. Okay, so uh, in that times, in that times, when, when USA and, and, and China share nothing, the common interest. Okay, so so maybe maybe it's, it's very, very serious. Okay, so uh, it's, it's not, I, I think it's not just uh, we'll, we'll uh, influence the, the, few, the next step of the US and China relations. It's, it's also will spill over, yeah, to influence the regional, the regional, the affairs. So, including the peninsula and the Taiwan. Okay, so uh, I think I think okay. So maybe I, I suggest uh, everyone we we need to just uh, keep attention very seriously and and actually of course we hope uh, maybe some if someone can stand uh, sit sit down to talk, but uh, we just can look and see. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Cha. Actually, the, the, after checking the, the whether any questions from the, the audience or not, I will give you the, the another chance to the, the give us answer, uh, if possible. Uh, Once again, I'd like to ask any questions from the floor. No? Okay, then. Okay, to Professor Lee, I'd like to give a couple of more minutes to him. Um, I mean, to what I mean, Professor Nishino Jr. said, and maybe you can also combine your comments with, I mean, to Professor uh, Dr. Jung's, I mean, to questions as well. Thank you. Please make it short. Okay, I will try. Okay, first of all, to Dr. Jung. Yes, it was a really good question posed. Well, first of all, I mean, in the First World War, the level of globalization back then and now there are differences. Yes, and what I think is that back then, during the First World War, I mean, the level of globalization and dependence, interdependence in terms of economy, I, mean, I think it was quite significant. But then, I mean, UK and Germany, they were in conflict, but still they were, I mean, the, the biggest and the second biggest, I mean, trade partners to each other. And as already, I mean, highlighted before, the gold packing system, I mean, the globalization of the financial system, I mean, actually growth quite a lot. So from various perspectives, I mean, there can be different opinions, but that's what I think. I mean, there are a lot of similarities in terms of the level of globalization back then and now. And one more thing, I mean, the, the nuclear weapon free zone are we going to have one in East Asia or not? I mean, we have current, I mean, military alliance. I mean, can it be compatible? Can they exist at the same time? Yes, this is a really important question. For example, the, I mean, the pacifist law in Japan, I mean, maybe some say in Japan and I mean, the US, is, it's really difficult to have that kind of, I mean, the nuclear weapons free zone in East Asia. I mean, in the past, to some extent, yes, I agreed. I mean, the, the military alliance and nuclear umbrella, I mean, defense. Can we do it at the same time? I mean, okay, nuclear weapons free zone as part of, I mean, the protocol. That protocol, maybe we can include it. But I think it's possible, at least in my time or our time. So in the Central Asia, I mean, maybe I mean, five major powers. I mean, they did not, all of, not all of them signed it, but there are already agreed, I mean, nuclear weapons free zone, like, I mean, Kazakhstan. But actually, for example, they are maintaining a military alliance or, I mean, the agreement with Russia. So, for example, if China or Russia strikes, I mean, either Japan or Korea, let's assume that, then such a treaty, it's, I mean, no longer valid. Then to the, I mean, to 
nuclear-free zone. I mean, U.S. will be certainly one of the signatories because uh, this is an international, I mean, the treaty. But either Russia or China attacks, I mean, the Korean Peninsula or Japan with a nuclear weapon. Hypothetically, if it happens, it's not a counter, I mean, attack to, I mean, Korean Peninsula or Japan. So, I mean, the nu nuclear umbrella defense system by the U.S. will be targeting either Russia or China. So, I believe it's compatible. I mean, it can be coexistent, having the, I mean, the military alliance and a nuclear weapons free zone in, in East Asia. And one more thing. But once again, we are running out of time, Professor. I'm sorry to interrupt you in the middle. You have 10 seconds. Thank you. OK, one more thing I'd like to add is that, like, I mean, Dr. Daun Jung said, it, this is related to that. The peace treaty I mentioned, there are two types of it in the, I mean, to human history. And I mean, the 1951 San Francisco Treaty or the 73 in Vietnam Paris Agreement, uh, Paris Peace Agreement. And 1919, I mean, wrapping up the first, I mean, the World War, Versailles, I mean, peace treaty agreement. So all these were after a war, kind of, I mean, I mean, result of the war. It's a kind of, I mean, kind of, I mean, payment receipt we get after the war. And at the same time, I mean, today, if you look at it now, it's a kind of, I mean, document we are going to create, we want to create to prevent future war, potential war for our future, not just for, I mean, Korean Peninsula. So once again, that means that these, I mean, signing or reaching a peace treaty or peace agreement is not something that comes at the end of our, this, I mean, activity. It's something that should come in the beginning of our discussion. So, I mean, the previous Moon Jae-in administration, unfortunately, the, wasn't really successful to have it actually concluded. Thank you very much. Your time's up. I'm sorry. <laughs> For, for, I'll give um, each discussant for their final um, comment for 30 for 30 seconds. If um, not, the uh, can you have any close remark? No, nothing to say now. It's okay. Okay, thank you. 예, 굉장히 사실은 well. I'm really sorry that I had to keep time. You know, if I just let you talk, you know, we could spend the entire day. Uh, every time I write a column about the current situation, I get like in you know, the harsh comments and why are you writing on this or having this kind of view? So we're in, we're living in this difficult times. And I'd like to thank um, Professor Lee and Professor Chai and all the um, discussants for their enthusiastic um, inputs. You know, we are in a dilemma that we have to push ahead with um, the idealistic plan. And we are in the situation that we have to do that. And, and the second point I'd like to raise is that whenever I talk to um, the specialists on the German issues, they tell us, you know, don't prepare anything. And if you prepared enough, but you know, on the, the day comes and you have prepared nothing. So even if um, there, there may be no solutions, but in order for us to be well prepared, you know, we have to prepare ourselves for the time. And in the next section, we're going to talk about the crisis in the global supply chain. And I think um, the U.S. is um, trying to break down the global supply chain that is led by China, and that involves lots of political factors. And I believe in the next section, session, this will be talked about and discussed. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And please bear with my impoliteness that I had to cut you um, in, in the middle way. Thank you.
Thank you for the discussions. I mean, it was really, I mean, interesting, heated discussion. Once again, please give a big hand to the presenters and discussants. Now, with this, we will conclude the second session. And the next session is prepared by KMI. And we will start the KMI session at 3 p.m. So we will take just five minute break. So once again, in five minutes, the next session, KMI session will begin. Thank you. <laughs>